summer semester. Produced in association with Bergen Community College, Paramus, New Jersey, presents Paradox of Power, U.S. Foreign Policy, Part 6, Beyond Nationalism, The Global Perspective. Today's topic, Review of Current Policy, with Harrison E. Salisbury, former associate editor with the New York Times, in conversation with Henry F. Graff, professor of history at Columbia University. We are at the end of this long series on the uh, formulation and conduct of United States foreign relations, uh, Harrison. And we have been asked to summarize and uh, possibly draw some conclusions and perhaps look down the road a bit. Suppose I begin with uh, human rights, uh, the uh, innovative slogan of this administration, the tag of this administration in international affairs, among some others, but certainly the most dramatic. How useful is the public advocacy of human rights internationally uh, as an instrument of foreign policy formulation, do you think? Well, I don't know that it has great value as an instrument of uh, foreign policy uh, formulation. I, it seems to me that its great usefulness is in uh, expressing to the world our own dedication to the rights and principles uh, that we believe in that our uh, United States was founded upon. Uh, these are principles which uh, are observed fairly well in the United States, uh, have never been very well observed around the world. Uh, they are idealistic uh, principles. And this, in this particular stage of the world's history, we live in an age of cynicism. And I think that uh, it is true that around the world, most people have not believed that American principles, that Americans believed in their own principles. I think that, um, that they had a rude shock, for example, at the time of Watergate, when it suddenly turned out that Americans could be outraged uh, by their officials uh, lying and engaging in deception and things of that kind, which to most citizens of most countries is just the name of the game. This is the way politicians behave. So when an American president comes forth and says that he believes in human rights and he would like to see them uh, around the world, it's an expression of traditional American idealism and I think a very important one. If we try to couple that, however, um, and use diplomatic power or economic power or something of that kind to impose on other countries um, this American stamp, I think that it is very often counterproductive to overall diplomacy. Do you think we can be selective in applying uh, our call for human rights so that we omit uh, a verbal assault on Uganda, Chile, the Philippines? In fact, uh, we even send the vice president to visit the Philippines, don't we? we Does, do. Is that counterproductive, do you think? I think it is bound uh, in the minds of people in the countries involved uh, to raise questions of uh, possible hypocrisy. Uh, are we employing a double standard in foreign policy? Well, not the double standards are unusual. If, uh, it very often is the case that you have double standards in foreign policy. But in this particular case where we've made such a thing about human rights, uh, I think it's almost incumbent upon us to play it across the board. But when I say that, at the same time, it seems to me it's also incumbent upon us that while we state our principles and make it quite clear that we don't approve of violations of, of the rights of individuals, that we don't seem somehow to come in heavy-handed and try to enforce sure. our morals on other people. I don't think that anyone really uh, likes that sort of thing. On the subject of human rights, I, I dare say the most dramatic uh, uh, moment in the history of human rights legislation was the great uh, human rights uh, charter of the United Nations. Um, and I suppose it's uh, a long time since we associated Mrs. Roosevelt with human rights. It's not exactly new. It was once a UN undertaking, wasn't it? Now it's become it an American undertaking. What's happened there? What uh, role is the UN playing? I think now that it's time for some kind of judgment to be made on the UN. Uh, the UN has already survived longer than the League of Nations did. Uh, it flourishes uh, here in New York, physically. Uh, 
Uh, how about internationally? How do you think it is related to United States foreign policy making? Well, I think that um, the UN sort of moves in and out so far as American policy making is concerned, so far as the policy of many of the major powers are concerned, and this has always been true. If we go back to the original concept of the United Nations as sort of a small club of the world's great powers, which were really going to organize and run the world, and I must say that was really the concept that was in the minds of, of the course. big three or the big four, yeah. it certainly hasn't worked out that way because the club broke up almost before the membership keys could be handed out. But if we consider the United Nations as a, uh, as a different kind of a club, a place where the diplomats of all countries, big and small, meet every day to carry on the business of diplomacy, whether it be small change or important things, you can see that the United Nations has provided a mechanism which uh, handles an enormous number of world problems. It handles them efficiently, quietly. We don't even realize it's functioning. It's purring away, handling these problems. When it comes to the big crises of the world, almost inevitably, whether the question is debated in the Security Council, in the corridors of the United Nations or in a quiet uh, corner of the uh, lounge, you will find diplomats getting together to do their professional business, which is to sound each other out on the possibility of a compromise here, an arrangement there. Like the settlement of the Berlin blockade some exactly, years ago. Exactly, exactly like that. And even, indeed, uh, we find it almost every year there is a crisis somewhere and the United Nations plays its role. For example, take the um, the uh, case in the Israeli uh, movement of troops into Lebanon, into southern Lebanon. Uh, a major crisis. It shook the world up. What mechanism was used to resolve that crisis? It was the United Nations with its own peacekeeping force, which was moved in there and which gradually took over from the Israeli troops the security of that particular zone. Uh, the United Nations has uh, it's grown up, I think, over the years. Uh, it's been um, well, it's been more than 30 years since it was founded, and it has it has devised certain methods of operating in critical situations. Uh, which are essential, I think, to pr the preservation of world peace and security. Do you think that the uh, ambassador of the United States, the United Nations, will ever have the prestige of the Secretary of State? No, I don't think so. And in fact, I don't happen to think that he should have the prestige of the Secretary of State. Because the ambassador to the United Nations or to any country is, after <coughs> all, a position which is secondary to the Secretary of State who has the whole charge of American foreign policy uh, as it is uh, uh, delegated to him by the President. And uh, so the ambassador uh, is a very important, probably the most important single ambassador, but he still is not of the importance of the Secretary of State. Now it is true, unfortunately, that we've had some very distinguished uh, uh, ambassadors to the United Nations who have become little more than errand boys because policy is made in Washington and often en enough the appointment was made politically to a man who really wasn't on the inner councils in the inner councils. Like Stevenson, for Stevenson example. Stevenson was the one I had in mind most notably. Goldberg, too. Goldberg was another example of exactly the same tendency. And in each case, these men thought they were going to have a big input into policy. In each case, they did not. Uh, that is unfortunate. Uh, I think that uh, the ambassador to the United Nations should have an important uh, input, but also knowing how political systems operate, and it's not just the American system, it's all the other uh, systems, one must realize that uh, the policy is made at home. Uh, I think it would be hard to demonstrate that the British representative to the United Nations has ever had the input in policy of a foreign secretary. Yes. Uh, certainly the um, Soviet uh, ambassador to the UN does not have the input that Gromyko has. I don't think they should have, I think they, but there should be a process back and forth. It shouldn't be simply handing orders out and expecting that man to carry them out. But the, the ambassador to the United Nations, whoever he may be, is often 
appointed as a function of domestic politics rather than uh, because of a special relationship he might have with the Secretary of State. That's in true. In fact, That's these are true. rival fiefdoms, it seems to me. Well, we have those rivalries. We have them in, in, involved in the government with the President's security advisor, who, interestingly enough, it seems to me, in recent years, the President's security advisor uh, is beginning to become a person almost more important than Secretary of State. And this is a process we've seen going on through several presidents, and I think it may it may continue, it may evolve, eventually maybe the Secretary of State will become a relatively secondary position. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I think we can see that tendency in government. Yes, uh, of course the uh, President's National Security Advisor is not confirmed by the Congress. That's right. And, but he is physically close to the President, he's at his close. elbow and Very sees him close. frequently during that's the right. day. I think we'd have to say the beginning with President Kennedy. Uh, that the security advisor has been a very important, uh, a more important man than the secretary. Of State. Some of this, of course, grows out of the fact that uh, in the world that's emerging, we will have crises that become almost uh, always potentially nuclear crises. And the, the White House has been transformed into a kind of command post so that uh, you will have uh, perhaps not as dramatically, but uh, surely we will have repetitions of the kind of situation that obtained during the Cuban Missile Crisis. That's and true. We sat day long, night long at sessions, determining policy in the White House itself. That is true, and this, of course, it reflects the polarization of the world, the enormous concentration of power in the United States and in the Soviet Union, and the relative um, lack of strength of the other powers to influence uh, the situation. At the other, on the other hand, there is a counter tendency, as I know you are well aware, of the proliferation of small countries. Yes. Which and is one of the reasons for the problems at the UN. Itself. That's right. Uh, they, 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 they proliferated to the point at which I can't even count. Uh, there must be 130 members of the UN. I remember years ago, Dag Hamishold uh, saying to me and, and some of my colleagues that uh, they weren't behaving like a parliament either, so the no. blocks were That's discernible right. and deals were not being made between blocks. They were That's individual uh, entities. That's true, and the same thing affects uh, the overall course of foreign policy in the world. And I think what we have seen, really, in the, in the period uh, since World War II has not only been polarization of power in the two great powers, but also the ability of small nations, the tails to wag the dogs. Again and again, we've seen in American policy the ability of some small ally or some small power associated with us to compel us to move policy in one way or another uh, through blackmail. Yes. And the same thing happens with all the great powers, I think. Where does the arms race fit into the world that's coming? The arms race is probably the most important uh, factor in world stability. Uh, that exists. It is the most potentially destabilizing force. It, um, so it's a factor in world stability and instability. Instability, that's right. It now uh, takes about, uh, I suppose, close to 50% of the Soviet national budget goes into military or, or quasi-military military purposes because we have a larger gross national product by twice, twice, twice as big as that of the Soviet Union, our percentage is substantially less. Let's say it's around 20% or something of that nature. But this is a huge, a remarkable amount of money going into a totally non-productive <coughs> enterprise. Perhaps necessary, but non-productive. So that it, it really conditions world economy. Uh, were the great powers uh, to reach some kind of an agreement allowing them to radically reduce these expenditures for armaments, it would be destabilizing because the economies, are not only of the two countries, but of the whole world, would suddenly have all sorts of ends fluttering in the wind. And no way of concentrating this capital no to produce jobs and, and uh, other kind of uh, And fallout. as things are now set up, and this I think is a very insidious thing, both in the United States and the Soviet Union, we not only are concentrating on making our own arms, but we depend on a secondary market uh, to take our surplus arms. And we literally create this market in other countries by making it easy for them to take our second generation weapons, the ones that we don't need anymore. And the Russians do the same thing. And we say, well, we have to do that to keep our own costs down. Well, I don't know. <laughs> this is really a very, the kind of economy that any economist ever imagined existing in the world. And uh, certainly it has given the world a certain pattern 
which I think is, uh, is really ominous. I worry about war as a factor in, in leadership and uh, war as a concentrator not only of capital but of national energy. Uh, I'm struck by the fact that we seem in the Western world, I guess worldwide, to validate leadership only when that leader or potential leader has been triumphant in war. I, I reflect on the important uh, credentials which Mao had in the world, that Castro has in the world, that Sadat and Begin have in the world, that um, Tito has in the world. They were blooded. Uh, they were ratified by triumph. Uh, as I look at Schmidt and Giscard and Callahan and, and even at uh, Carter, there's a kind of gray sameness. Do we have a way in this tightly knit world, this uh, world that sometimes in the uh, heat of the arms race seems about to explode, do we have any way of making leaders big men without first getting them into a war and allowing them to win. In a, in a strange way, uh, we're missing, if you understand the way I say this, a Westmoreland in the line of the presidents. Do we have a substitute? Well, that's a very difficult question indeed. Uh, I think one has to go back, perhaps, uh, a good bit in American political history uh, to find a, a good example of, um, of a leader who has emerged as a full-fledged uh, leader without having, uh, having won a war or fought a, a major battle in it. And I suppose the one that comes most distinctly to mind is Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, he, had, uh, he was, to be sure, in the Navy during World War I, but he played a very minor role. Practically. It's interesting that he couched no. his inaugural address in 1933 <laughs> in the language of a war leader. We must right. act as if we were, in fact, invaded by a foreign foe is almost an exact quotation. This is true. And, uh, and he considered his task, which was uh, domestic, basically, although it was more international than I think many of us realize, uh, in terms of a war, a war against poverty, a war against the economic uh, desolation yes. in which he found the country. But he, had, he was not a military leader. Now, it is true that before he vanished from the scene, he became a military leader, but this was not essential to his function. Uh, we, take, we take another man, the man who succeeded him, uh, Truman. Uh, he was not a war leader either, but he was blooded, as it were, in, in conflicts just so short of war, in the, in the orig originating period of the Cold War when he went face to face with the Soviet Union in a series of, uh, of crises that could have been uh, warlike crises. And there's no doubt in my mind that it gave him a certain muscularity and a certain stature. And his uh, strength was never greater than immediately after the entry into the Korean War. That's quite true. Now, we have a phenomenon which I think is, uh, is a negative phenomenon in, in our presidency, which has arisen out of the very circumstance that you're talking about, which is a tendency, I think, of presidents uh, who feel that they must talk tough to the Soviet Union, they must, in a sense, go to the brink and show they have the courage to go to the brink before they can be validated. I think this was uh, manifest first and very dramatically in Kennedy. I think Kennedy felt quite clearly that he was under challenge to show that he was capable of standing up to Khrushchev, and he did so in the Cuban Missile Crisis and before that in the... Uh, in the uh, Berlin yes. uh, crisis, these two examples, which in a sense did give him that validity. Uh, was it necessary? I'm not so sure that it really was necessary, but it set a pattern. And I remember seeing an um, explanation of, um, of uh, some of Carter's diplomacy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Soviet Union, uh, someone in Washington saying, some advisor uh, to uh, Mr. Carter saying, it seems as though they're out to test our manhood. Yes. I wondered whether the Russians were testing their manhood or these men themselves were testing it because of a feeling that unless they showed that ability to be tough, they couldn't function effectively as presidents. Don't you think that uh, Americans are trapped by what they saw on the screen a half generation ago out of Hollywood, that the... Uh, uh, the John Wayne view of the world is deeply ingrained, that uh, we've seen victory at sea so often on the television tube that uh, uh, we have to measure up, that there is a kind of um, 
poison in the bloodstream that has somehow to be eliminated before we fully enter upon a global perspective uh, worthy of, uh, I guess I have to say, the 21st century. Well, that may be true, but I think it's a, I, I myself think it's a small boy uh, tendency. Uh, I was much struck uh, when Henry Kissinger, in a very notable um, interview with a, a brilliant Italian uh, woman correspondent, uh, described his own image of himself as the lone cowboy marching off into the West. And I, there's no one I think of less like a lone <laughs> cowboy than Henry Kissinger, but I could see his image and his feeling that he was out there alone to face the world with his two pistols on, on his hips and ready for anything. I don't believe that's a 21st century image. I think that if we go back to the, the John Wayne image and the lone cowboy image, we're in deep trouble because the problems of nuclear weaponry and the problems of the technological age, the intercommunication oh. systems that were involved have utterly nothing to do with manhood, with pistols, with cowboys, with John Wayne. Uh, they require cool nerves. They require a, uh, a great deal of intellect, a steady knowledge, an ability not to, to be provoked just to show manhood. Uh, so I get very worried when I read these images fluttering across the newspapers or on the television screens. All right. Some few years ago, a very brilliant uh, Columbia historian uh, wrote a piece in which he made the argument that beyond nationalism, which, as you know, is the title of this part uh, of, of this series, that beyond nationalism lay the multinational corporations, that the multinational corporations, collectively considered, were going to be, uh, before this century was over, a kind of substitute for the international church of another century. How do you respond to that? I don't know whether I uh, would go that far in that uh, kind of a uh, evocation of the multinational corporation. It seems to me the multinational corporation plays a very important and in, an increasing role in the world, but I don't see them acquiring that enormous power to influence the course of events, uh, which, uh, let's say, the Roman Catholic Church played in the high heyday of its enormous world power, where where the governments, the monarchies of Europe were really all subordinate to that great power. Uh, truly, a multinational corporation can influence a small country, its economy and its politics. Can they influence a great country like the United States or the great countries of Europe? I, I, they can move them around to a certain extent, but we've, we've developed a great deal of antagonism toward that sort of thing in the United States in recent years. Now, that antagonism grows probably out of the felt uh, belief that uh, we have interests that are independent of business interests, that uh, some of these interests are based on sentiment, some on needs, security needs that are independent even of the best uh, economic needs of some of the major corporations. Do you think that you could give your mind for a minute or two to the relationship between interest and sentiment in the making of foreign affairs? Well, I think that uh, sentiment is often a much more important ingredient than is perceived because it's almost an in invisible element. I think we have an example of that at the present time as far as China is concerned. I don't think Americans quite realize it, but they have a very strong emotional attachment to China. I'm not talking about the sort of disenchantment that followed the rise of Mao and the perceived so-called loss of China. Uh, the emotional attachment to China beginning in the middle of the 19th century and fed by, by reading of romance, by the China trade, by the missionaries, all the different kinds of involvement, and also by the fact that we didn't participate, as we saw it in any event, in the rape of China, uh, has created a rather uh, a favorable ground, a favorable sentimental ground for uh, China policy in this country. And uh, excuse me, we've also had ups and downs. Oh, there are bad yes. people, then oh. good people. Also the Japanese, the I must Japanese say, as we're talking about Asians. The chrysanthemum people, 
than the people of the sword. That's right. And of course, we've had, we've had the same kind of image with England, which once was the enemy, and then we have a very now I think a very sentimental feeling Feel toward England. England yes. France, we've we once were very sentimental about. La now we're, France, <laughs> we're rather yes. cynical about the French. We think they're out to, to do us in. The Germans, we've gone from Gemütlichkeit to hatred of the Nazis and back again to the admiration, uh, admiration that sort of thing. The Russians, I'm afraid, uh, all the way back to Catherine the, the Great, we've pretty been much been antagonistic to for one reason or another. These are all important factors which uh, probably politicians instinctively take into consideration in making policy, but maybe the public at, at large doesn't perceive and realize how influential they are in making policy. On, we have only a minute or two on this matter. To what extent are the various ethnic groups in America determinants of foreign policy along the lines of sentiment quite as much as uh, of interest? They can be very, very important. I think there's no question... And troublesome. There's no question that the, uh, the uh, Jewish uh, element in the United States, with its enormously strong and principled and also sentimental attachment to Israel, uh, acts as a major determinant in policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Israel. That's probably the strongest single link that we have today. But in World War I, uh, the German minority in this country played a major role, and even in the years before World War II, in breaking the movement of the United States toward war. The Irish uh, minority in this country has always given us a special policy toward Ireland. The Italian population, uh, to a certain extent, a special policy toward the Poles. Italy. The Poles, absolutely, the Poles. All of these elements do feed into this marvelously complex taf tapestry, which we call American foreign policy. We're the only nation in the world that has this fundamental problem, dealing with poli policies that have to be satisfactory, more or less, to significant elements who play a part in domestic politics. Is this a price for our kind of democracy? Is this a price for democracy in the making of foreign policy? It's particularly our price. It doesn't exist, as you say, in any other country. Many other countries simply don't know what, we're ta we're, what we talk about when we say have to think about this because the polls in Buffalo can vote a congressman out of office. Do you think there is any way, then, that we can talk of a national interest as uh, compared with the sum total of ethnic-oriented interests that are oh, constantly being I think, being so. I think so, because I think a national interest in this country will supersede and superimpose over any specific interest if it's big enough and sharp enough. Well, thank you very much, uh, Harrison. Uh, I think that we've cut this right on the mark, and uh, we haven't talked too much. Thank you. <laughs> Harrison E. Salisbury is former associate editor of the New York Times and author of Black Night, White Snow. Henry F. Graff is professor of history at Columbia University and author of The Tuesday Cabinet. The Foreign Policy Association has prepared a study guide to accompany the series. For further information and a free brochure, write to Dr. Philip C. Dolce, Bergen Community College, Paramus, New Jersey, 07652. This is the final program of the summer semester series, Paradox of Power, U.S. Foreign Policy. The following colleges are offering credit for a course based on this series. program was recorded.